First of all, uh, I should tell you that I feel fine, even though I sound like I'm on death's doorstep, don't I? So I woke up this morning with no voice. For a priest, that's not a real good Sunday morning thing to do. But uh, I feel perfectly fine. I don't have a sore throat. So uh, I, don't, I don't think I deserve any sympathy yet. We'll work on that, but that's it. Secondly, I was thinking this morning, driving out here to church, uh, we signed an annual snow removal contract with uh, some contractors, and last year, a beautiful winter, we lost a lot of money, but I think we're making it up this year. <laughs> I think it's all going to come out even in the end. I, think it, um, I know many, many of you have been on our Parish Light of the World retreat. I hope eventually that all of you will be able to go on it. For those who have been, you're familiar with the double message of that term, light of the world. First of all, like today's Feast of Epiphany proclaims so loudly, Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The Magi follow the light of the star in order to find the one who is the true light of the world. As a grown man, Jesus would tell us in John chapter 8, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. But then, that same Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5, you are the light of the world. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. He puts it on a lampstand so that all in the house have light. In the same way, men must see your good deeds and give glory to the Father. So Jesus is the light of the world, but he tells us that we are to be light for the world as well. How? Let me share a couple ideas, but let me encourage you to think along with me, because I bet all of you have insights on how our Lord is asking you to be a light for our world. First of all, be a light by fearlessly living out your faith. I wish I had a nickel for every time somebody has told me this story. Basically, the story goes like this. Father, um, on my desk at the office, I have a little crucifix, a little holy card, a picture of my family. And I hear jokes about that holy Joe, or, boy, he's sure religious kook, isn't he? But then, inevitably, somebody will come to me when nobody else is around and say, my wife is just diagnosed with cancer. Will you pray for her? Our marriage is in trouble. We say a prayer. The point is made. Publicly, they might be ridiculed. But when the chips are down, who do they come to? What do they ask? One of the best ways that we can be a light for the world is by fearlessly living out our faith. Come with me. I read a story this week about Ben Franklin back in the 1700s. He wanted to get the people of Philadelphia to try street lighting, which was non-existent at the time. But he didn't want to persuade them by talking about it. So instead, he hung a lantern on a long bracket outside his front door. Every evening as dusk approached, he lit the wick. People wandering the dark streets saw it. And soon, his neighbors began putting lanterns in brackets in front of their own homes. Before long, the entire city saw the value of street lighting, and Philadelphia got lights on their streets. When you and I courageously live out our faith, in much the same way, the moral influence, that's called the moral influence of our life, will touch others. That man, that woman with that crucifix and picture of a uh, holy picture on the desk, were exerting a moral influence on the lives of others. All of us, every day, exert either a moral or an immoral influence by the way we're living out our life. And when we do so, we'll be what Jesus is asking us to do. We'll be lights for the world. Another way to be light for the world, which I really hadn't thought about until I read about this recently, is to listen to other people. Our world today is full of people longing to be listened to. Who really, really listens to you? 
Your spouse? I hope so. Your best friend? Your parents? Parents are usually great about that. But the point is, not very many folks. Most people want you to tell them the Reader's Digest version of the story you're telling so they can talk about something really interesting like themselves, right? I read about one city right here in the Midwest that started a phone service called Dial a Listener. It focused on lonely people who just hungered for the sound of a sympathetic human voice just to give them a human connection. When you really listen to someone, when you ask them follow-up questions, you can tell if somebody's listening to you or not. Because when you pause for a breath, do they jump in with their own story? Or do they say, well, I didn't quite understand. When you were saying that, what did you mean by that? Follow-up questions convey to the person, I'm really listening to you. I care about what you're saying. When you do that, people know you care. It's a wonderful way to be a light of the world. Finally, actually serving, helping others, is an important way to be a light of the world. You've heard the saying, people don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. It's true. You can have all the information in the world, but if people don't think you care about them, you won't get through to them. St. Francis Xavier is one of the most incredible, successful missionaries in the history of the Catholic Church. It's said that he personally baptized over 400,000 people. But it's also true that people knew that he cared about them. He brought to needy people medicines when he could, and always education for their minds. He taught them. And people responded to him, and therefore to the invitation to believe in Jesus Christ that he brought along with that. A good way for us to be lights for the world is to find a need and fill it. To find a hurt and heal it. Then people will be ready to hear the good news that we have to tell them about Jesus Christ. Their hearts will be opened. Finally, I was reading, struck again this week, so many of the fathers of the church, so many spiritual writers on this Feast of Epiphany write about the Magi's following the star which speaks, they say, of human restlessness and of how that can be a gift for us. No doubt inside all of us there is a restlessness, a searching, an incompleteness. Pope Benedict said this, he said, human beings have an innate, an innate restlessness for God. But this restlessness is a participation in God's restlessness for us. God has a restlessness for us. He quotes a beautiful church hymn to Jesus. Thou with weary steps have sought me. Crucified have dearly bought me. May thy pain not be in vain. There is a restlessness of men for God, but there is also a restlessness of God for men. Faith is simply being seized by God. Letting God catch us. One of my favorite poems is The Hound of Heaven by Francis Thompson. And he compares our Lord to the best bloodhound in the world that pursues us and try as we might, we can't shake him off our scent. He's not going to let go. He's going to catch up with us. And that poem ends after the author has fled God into every lovely thing you could think of. The last words of the poem, God says to him, Ah, thou fondest, blindest, weakest, I am he whom thou seekest. It's true. All of us, whether we know it or not, are seeking for our God to build our life on him. We can be very successful in the eyes of the world, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. With many wonderful achievements, or wealth, or fulfillment, but we'll still feel a deeper hunger, a need, that pull of Jesus Christ on our soul. Pope Francis puts it this way, Is Christ the center of my life? 
Have I made Christ, have I let Christ make me his own? It's not only the Magi. The wise ones in every generation seek the truth. And when they find it, like the Magi, they adore it. They subject themselves to it. The truth claims us whole and entire for itself. And blessed will we be if we surrender ourselves wholly to it, body and soul. Let me repeat that. The truth claims us whole and entire for itself. And blessed will we be if we surrender ourselves to it, body and soul. That's why, really, we have our Adoration Chapel. That's why we adore, because we were made for that. Christ is the answer to all of our searching, our longing. So we come to Him. <clears throat>